Live from Welcome to the friendly confines of the KSAT 12 newsroom. I'm Steve Spreester along with Myra Arthur. We are having some technical problems in our main studio. So just like we did the five, we're going to do the six from our newsroom set. We're improvising here on our digital set right in the middle of our newsroom. We hope you'll roll with us for the next hour. It's going to be interesting, but the mission remains the same. We got a lot of news to get to. Yeah, and we're going to begin with breaking news tonight. An increase in security and a student arrested after a threat online. Police taking these threats seriously, especially after what we saw in Uvalde just seven months ago. Highlands High School sent out this letter to parents just today about a heightened police presence there. This is after police with San Antonio ISD traced a threat online back to a student within that district. They say that threat targeted the Brackenridge and Highland High School campuses. The district says no threats were credible, but the student is in custody and they emphasize that everyone is safe. Now to another big story that we are tracking this evening. Atascosa County deputies have arrested a San Antonio man and woman in connection with a body that was found alongside of a road near Pleasanton. Yeah, that body found Tuesday night. Today, investigators say they have two people who have confessed to the murder. Atascosa County deputies believe the victim was shot during a robbery. We're fortunate not to, to deal with this on a daily basis. Things of this nature are tragic and everybody has a family. And, and so, yes, it's, it's something that uh, it's going to hit somebody real hard. Investigators identified that victim as 25 year old Lucio Carmona. They arrested David Castleberry and Clarissa Guillen in this case. Both of them are from San Antonio and they're facing murder charges. Investigators still want to know more about the victim and why he was with those two suspects. San Antonio firefighters are still investigating what caused a fire that forced several people out of their home last night. There were seven people inside this house on Rourke Drive and Kevin. That's on the east side. They told firefighters they smelled smoke before then figuring out the garage was on fire. Everyone did make it out safely, but a cat died in a bedroom. Meantime, a fire on the south side left a three generation family without a place to live. This fire also hits close to home for us here at KSAT because it is the home of one of our interns, Sarah Cervera. Yeah, Sarah spoke to our RJ Marquez about how her family is trying to recover and rebuild that home that stood for decades. But this is my room, um, and unfortunately, everything in here got lost. Sarah Severa and her family are picking up the pieces after a fire destroyed part of their south side home. Immediately, I felt the flames, and I turned, and I saw the shed on fire. So then I had to go the other way to exit. So I ran to see out when the house was engulfed. I ran immediately to get my daughters out. Severa lived in the home with her mom, sisters, and elderly aunt. The fire broke out on December 30th, displacing three generations of her family. My family has always been my priority, and I, I don't want them to be homeless. And Sarah tells us that this fire started in this back shed and that flames quickly spread to this part of the house. You could see all the damage here that's been left behind. Now, Sarah tells us that the family did not have homeowners insurance, making the process of rebuilding their home that much more difficult. We have to try to find a way to do it, like with the help of other organizations, and if not, ultimately on our own, which is going to be really, really difficult. But the San Antonio chapter of the American Red Cross helped more than 1,100 individuals last year whose homes were either damaged or destroyed by a fire. Not having homeowners insurance is not part of the criteria to get help, but it's something many families face after a fire. I'm hoping and praying that there's organizations out there that would help. Um, I have tried and my daughter has tried. Cervera, a case at intern, said she will continue to reach out for help. She salvaged a few meaningful items from the fire, but the health of her family and her mother is what matters most. Okay, I know we're in poverty, but one day, Mika, you're going to be the one to save us and get us out. So I want to make sure that I can complete that promise for her. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. I know, but we've been trying to rally around Sarah, give her the support she needs any way we can, so we're wishing her family all the best. Absolutely. Meantime, the mother of the Robb Elementary School shooter was arrested in Oklahoma. Police say she is accused of threatening to kill a man there. Jail records show that Adriana Martinez Reyes is charged with assault and battery and threatening to perform an act of violence. According to a police report, the man says that he feared Reyes would attack him in his sleep after the alleged threat. Oklahoma City Police told KSAT that Reyes confirmed she is the mother 
of the shooter at Robb Elementary. The San Antonio police still searching for a man accused of slashing a person inside a limousine in front of a funeral home downtown. As Katrina Weber reports, officers believe the victim had been calling that limo home. A car turned crime scene captures the attention of San Antonio police. They comb through it for evidence connected to a cutting. Although this limo parked outside Emmy Rodriguez funeral home appeared to be past its heyday, police believe it was providing the comforts of home to a 32 year old man. He told them he was living in it up until about 430 this morning when another man threatened his life slashing him all over his body with a knife. Police say after the stabbing here, the victim didn't stay put. He made his way across the street to that motel to get help. Officers found him in one of the rooms there. They say a friend staying at the River Inn Motel helped him call 911. The victim was taken to a hospital, but police say his wounds were not life threatening. While investigators went through the car looking for evidence, officers searched the area near South Frio and Guadalupe for the suspect and a woman who was a witness. They say the victim told them he has no idea why he was attacked, that he couldn't understand why the man who stabbed him was so upset because his attacker spoke only Spanish. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. A basketball game escalated into a fight that ended in a shooting, and police are now searching for that gunman. The shooting happened on Copper Hill Drive around 10 o'clock last night. That's not far from Thousand Oaks and Highway 281. Police say a group of teenagers were playing basketball when there was an argument, and someone fired several shots. A 19-year-old was hit in the arm. That victim was taken to a hospital and is expected to be okay. You know, a lot of us battling cedar fever. Mm -hmm. I'm one of them. I was battling it at five o'clock. As a matter of fact, a high number of flu cases, though, is normal for this time of year in South Texas. But lately, local doctors are treating and seeing more patients with RSV or COVID. It wasn't that long ago that hospital beds were at a premium because of respiratory illnesses. So Alyssa Cole spoke with an emergency room doctor now about what they're seeing. <clears throat> We're closing out a season of potlucks and in-person get-togethers, and we know sharing common areas comes with sharing germs. It's because of the indoor activities instead of outdoor activities. It's because, and you know, as compared to two years ago, we didn't see much of this at all. Emergency room doctor Robert Frolickstein and Methodist Hospital Metropolitan is breaking down the current uptick of respiratory tract infections, impacting people across San Antonio. We're seeing lots of uh, upper respiratory or respiratory tract infections. Um, typically, they are, uh, you know, I would say four to six weeks ago, it was predominantly RSV and flu and man, a little bit of COVID mixed in. He says more patients are being seen for virus related sickness, but among them are less flu cases and they're keeping an eye on COVID-19 infections. COVID is spiking a little bit, but uh, again, not particularly severe illness, um, which is great news. He says symptoms between COVID-19, flu, and RSV are similar, but over-the-counter medication and home remedies are safe to ease the pain. Symptoms that we feel because our body's fighting off the infection, our immune system drubbed up, those are the fevers, the chills, the body aches, the fatigue. You also want to keep in mind, if you have the most up-to-date COVID-19 or flu vaccines, it will not ease the uncomfortable symptoms of other respiratory infections. Alyssa Cole, KSAT 12 News. You know, a badge of honor for San Antonio is the military history that we have in this city. Absolutely. As Jonathan Coto reports, Joint Base San Antonio Fort Sam Houston's Army North celebrating 80 years and looking back at their major accomplishments. You know, we've got a, a big birthday coming up for Fifth Army. I mean, we're Army North, but we take our lineage from uh, United States Fifth Army, or Fifth United States Army, as it were. U.S. Army North celebrating 80 years at Joint Base San Antonio Fort San Houston, a place with lots of history. We were the first United States forces to conduct an assault on the European mainland in World War II. The birthday celebration hosted in Fort Sam Houston's historic quadrangle, featuring its own 323rd Army Band, demonstrations, a mass oath enlistment, and a Mexican air fighter squadron. Mexico made significant contributions during World War II. Mexico's 201st Air Fighter Squadron, the Aztec Eagles, served in the Pacific Theater during World War II, 
conducting 795 combat missions and logging almost 2,000 hours of flying time. Evans says they feel blessed to have the support of civic leaders, businessmen, women, and veterans throughout San Antonio. He adds they empower and make them who they are each and every day. Whether it's contributions during World War II or its response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. Army North says its mission will always nice place defending the homeland as its top priority. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a live look outside right now with live cam, and you can see just a beautiful night out there. We've I'm had looking a, forward to the weekend. Yeah, we've had a good stretch of sunsets this week, Adam. Oh, we have, but don't expect a sunrise like this tomorrow. Oh, oh, oh no, 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 no. We've got some noticeable and big changes headed our way and some dampness for the weekend. Today, another day with a big temperature spread. 46 in the morning, then 80 by the afternoon, and even lost a few hours of uh, daytime heating from the sun because of the fog earlier today. All right, here's a look at our temperature map across the state. There is a weak cold front that's moving into West Texas right now, and this will impact our weather a little bit this weekend. Right now we're 76 in town, 70s across most of the state. Right now 70 in Kerrville, 80 in Pleasanton. But as we go through the evening hours, temperatures falling off through the 60s, and then the fog develops, and tomorrow morning, low 60s, damp, drizzly, reduced visibility but also the chance for some real rain and storms. We'll get to that in just a bit, Steve. Thank you, Adam. Straight ahead on the KSAT News at 6, getting to the emergency room as soon as possible following a cardiac arrest, paramount. But doctors are stressing immediate medical attention given to a patient before they arrive at the hospital could make all the difference. We have some simple CPR steps when we come back. Tonight on the night beat, a beloved teacher, a coach, collapses on campus. Never prepared is never going to be easy. And, and you can prepare words, but that doesn't make it any easier. And a heartbreaking loss as his students and co-workers unable to save his life. The memories being shared now and what's being done to help the school move forward. Plus a new year, but the same frustrations along the St. Mary's Strip. As business owners say construction is still cutting into their bottom line. The response from the city and its contractors. Those stories and a lot more tonight on the Night Beat. A Buffalo Bill safety, DeMar Hamlin, is still critically ill after going into cardiac arrest during Monday night's football game. But his team says he's shown remarkable improvement at the hospital. This morning, tweeting that Hamlin's breathing tube was removed overnight. Now, knowing what to do when someone goes into cardiac arrest could mean the difference between life and death. CNN's Mandy Gaither has more on some simple steps that you can take right away. It can happen without warning, and when it does, time is of the essence. There's about 350,000 out of hospital sudden cardiac arrests a year. About 70 to 90 percent of people who suffer from this emergency condition die before they get to the hospital because those around them don't always know how to help. But CPR can double or even triple a person's odds of survival. However, only about 40 percent of Americans know this potentially life-saving procedure. If you suspect suspect someone is in cardiac arrest, cardiologist Dr. Tara Narula says first make sure the scene is safe, then call 911, and finally start hands-only CPR. Place your palms on the person's chest. Elbows locked, shoulders over, and you're going to push down hard and fast. Narula says you should be depressing the chest by about two inches, and you do this at a rate of about 100 to 120 beats per minute. Songs can help you keep the rhythm. Think of these tunes while you pump your palms. They're all 120 beats per minute. If you have access to an automated external defibrillator or AED, the box has simple steps on how to use it. It's going to analyze the heart rhythm. If it detects a rhythm that's shockable, tells you don't touch the patient, it's going to de deliver a shock. As soon as the shock is delivered, go back to CPR for two minutes. Then the AED will analyze the heart rhythm again. Don't be afraid to give hands-only CPR. Don't be afraid to okay. use the defibrillator. Yeah. You can save a life. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. All right, let's look at the forecast now. Let's take a look outside first. What we got shaping up this evening. It's been a pleasant week. But we got some changes that will be happening for the weekend. Absolutely. Adam Kasky joins us now. And I know that you, great. They're showing <laughs> oh, yeah. our shoes again. Yeah, all right. Did we're we mention the weekend? Yeah. It's the it's pretty the, much the, the weekend. These are our casual Friday 
outfits, just so you know, because yeah. we can't really speak for yourself. Know. Mine's functional Friday. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Better oh, for is, my feet and for my knees. Yeah. Uh, this yep. is for good your orthopedic. This is for my back. Dude. These are yeah. these are tennis shoes. These aren't like I'm wearing Pat Boone style <laughs> white. <laughs> <laughs> just in case people Listen, wonder. you guys aren't in tennis shoes and a dress. Take it away. <laughs> well put, well said. Uh, foggy drizzle to start the day tomorrow. You'll notice the dampness if you do uh, lace up your running shoes. The trails and sidewalks are likely to be very wet through, I think, at least 10 a.m. tomorrow. Then some scattered showers and thunderstorms developing after sunset Saturday evening and even lingering into Saturday night for some locations. But by Sunday, the sky clears out again and I think it's going to be a beautiful day. Sunday's actually looking pretty nice out there with lower humidity, a return to sunshine and even some comfortable temperatures as well. All right, let's talk about our rain chances and overall we're not looking at much other than tomorrow. That's really our only chance. 40% that is. That's Drizzle and sprinkles very likely in the morning, but then you know 40% chance of a few sprinkles as well. Then later in the evening, 40% chance and you know, moderate coverage of the showers and thunderstorms across our area. And that, that includes the metro area. I do think locally and east of I-35 is where we'll have the best odds of it. Looking across the state right now, quiet. You know, we've got the clear sky currently, but after midnight, the clouds are going to fill in very quickly. Another atmospheric river coming on shore in the western U.S. Another plume of moisture that they don't need right now. Uh, and so more flooding likely, but high elevation snow. I was looking at some of the snow reports in uh, California and the Sierra Nevadas from that last atmospheric river a few days ago, and it was over 100 inches. <whistles> Woo! Can you imagine? Anyway, we've got this little dip in the upper level flow that helped develop a cold front that's going to move in. And overall, overnight tonight, increasing humidity, fog, drizzle, future cast shows that for the morning. And even a few spritzes and sprinkles can't be ruled out. It's just more or less the nuisance dampness, reduced visibility on the roads, wet roadways, wet sidewalks, wet trails. And then by the midday hours, noon, we could have a break in the clouds here and there, but then quickly filling in again. And by tomorrow evening around and especially after sunset, that's when we're expecting some scattered showers and thunderstorms to develop and even some pockets of heavy rainfall at that point. Nothing widespread in terms of the heavy rain. So cross your fingers for your neighborhood. But still, there should be some areas of heavier rain and where those downpours set up, you could easily get a quick half an inch or more from some of those downpours. So again, basically just crossing your fingers in terms of that. And after midnight, 1 a.m., the action should be pushing east of town closer to Hallettsville. Moulton, even down toward Quero and Victoria and Carn City. So tomorrow, 62 in the morning, 68 at noon. If we're lucky, we'll see a little bit of sun at noon and then the scattered showers and storms developing. So not a washout of a day, but not exactly the best day this weekend. Sunday's going to be a lot nicer. All right, dew point right now at 54 degrees. That's on the rise. Dew points will be climbing and you'll really notice the stickiness in the air early tomorrow morning. And that's one reason why we're going to have the fog. So dew points in the 50s right now, but tomorrow morning they'll be in the 60s. And then that weak cold front we've been talking about that sweeps away the humidity humidity as we get on into Sunday. We get rid of the humidity at that point. So overall this weekend, tomorrow, the cloudy, damp day, and then we get into Sunday, the sunny. I'm trying to get there with my clicker. It's just the distance from the studio that we normally have. There we go. There's your forecast, 67 on Sunday. And there we go. 73 tomorrow, 67 Sunday next week. <laughs> Warmth the same. Sunny, 40s in the morning and afternoons in the 70s. Enjoy. All right. Switch. Yeah. Switch, yeah. <laughs> Adam out, Larry in, and we're talking about the Spurs with a, you know, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago when the Spurs and the Pistons were playing for championships. I know, it doesn't but seem that long ago at all. I remember I'm old. Well, I'm old as well, so <laughs> I don't think it was all that long ago. But hey, the Spurs are home tonight. It's their first home game of 2023. And you know what? They're playing without Devin Vassell. But the Spurs are used to playing shorthanded. And in men's college basketball, UTSA picked up a conference win last night thanks to a buzzer beating three. Coming up. To see the players' reaction um, they stood up right away and, and, and clapped for them and 
you know, yelled some things to him and it was a pretty, pretty cool exchange for a few seconds there. Sean McDermott and the Buffalo Bills were able to FaceTime with DeMar Hamlin today and the team absolutely loved it in big board sports. The San Antonio Spurs will tip off a quick two game homestand tonight with the Detroit Pistons, followed by the Boston Celtics tomorrow at 5 p.m. Back to back games for the Spurs. Now, yesterday we learned that guard Devin Vassell will undergo an arthroscopic procedure on his left knee next week, and he will be out indefinitely. Vassell has been dealing with left knee soreness all season that has caused him to miss nine games overall and three of the Spurs' last four contests. He's 22 years old and having the best season of his three year career. The Spurs are used to playing shorthanded, which is just part of the game. It's just the nature of, of this business, like uh, you're going to have um, guys hurt every now and then. Sometimes you go through stretches where there's a little bit more, um, sometimes a little bit less. If you think back to times like around COVID, we had like three, four, five, six guys out at the same time. So um, it just, uh, it's a little um, adversary that we got to deal with. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not that big a deal. Obviously, we want Devin back as soon as possible, but um, we'll, we'll deal with it un until he's back. Spurs will host the Pistons tonight at 7 at the AT&T Center. UTSA hosting Middle Tennessee last night at the Convocation Center, and John Bugs III delivered some March Madness in January. Tied at 72, the clock kicking down to zero, and Bugs for three, and he hits nothing but net, beating the buzzer, a game-winning shot for the redshirt junior. Bugs had 11 points, saving his best three for last. He's now made a team-high 39 three-pointers this season, and UTSA takes it 75-72 for the Roadrunners' first Conference USA win this season. They're seven Seven and eight overall, and one and three in Conference USA. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Buffalo Bills 24-year-old safety DeMar Hamlin is breathing on his own after his breathing tube was removed overnight, the Bills tweeted this morning. He's now able to talk with his family and health care providers. Just the latest step in his remarkable recovery in the four days since going into cardiac arrest and being resuscitated on the field during a game against the Cincinnati Bengals. Hamlin surprised his teammates this morning, talking to them on FaceTime and joining the Bills for their team meeting. The thing that <laughs> makes me laugh is, is he did this to the guys, you know, right away. Um, he flexed, he flexed, uh, he flexed on them, I guess. And uh, um, he's just got some staple things that they know him for and that he does. I mean, he made the heart, the heart symbol probably more than anything. Um, and then he gave him a thumbs up. So, uh, and then somewhere in the midst of, of that, and it was a little bit hard to hear, but he, as you'd imagine, he said, uh, he said, I love you, boys. And, uh, of course, I, think I got the guys. I love you boys. How cool is that? The boys tweeted they'll be wearing a, the Bills tweeted they'll be wearing a special number three patch on Sunday for their guy, DeMar Hamlin, when they host the New England Patriots. Still going to be a hard game for them to play. It sure is, but yeah. they said they're going to be a little less heavy hearted now because he's doing better. Yeah, yeah imagine absolutely. how excited that FaceTime was. Yeah. All right, thanks, Larry. We'll be right back. It is one of the biggest marches in the country. We're talking about the MLK Junior March, but Dream Week in San Antonio is much more than just that one event. There are a lot of things that are going to unfold, and we're very pleased to be joined by the CEO of Dream Week San Antonio, Shakari Nakpodia. Show, uh, as, are you okay with calling, me show, calling you show? Okay. Happy so, New Year. Happy, happy New Year show. Thank you too. I think we're a week away from Dream Week San Antonio starting. Talk about what Dream Week San Antonio is for people that may not be familiar. Well, um, we're very fortunate in San Antonio to have the, the largest community curated event of its kind in the nation. It's, we have about 200 plus events celebrating uh, you know, uh, an environment for civil and civic engagement. We want to um, just create this environment where the new Mandela's and the new Gandhi's and the new MLK's of this world can come out and uh, blossom. What kind of events are we talking about for somebody who wants to get involved? If you've got 200 events, it sounds like there's something for everybody, but what can people expect? Well, uh, um, there's so many, uh, but we have a speaker series. We have 24 um, speakers from all over the city who are going to be um, you know, speaking 30 minutes each at, look, at uh, local spots in the downtown area. We have a panel discussions. These are going to be streamed as well. Um, you know, we, we just have so many. I, I couldn't, we have a thousand plates for the hungry where 50 cars go out 
to feed our, to feed um, the hungry all over our city. We have the Olaju African uh, market uh, at Brick. Um, I could just go on and on and on, and someone's going to be upset that we haven't actually mentioned yeah. them today. But you're, you're making me hungry. Going, you're and, making me uh, hungry just by mentioning those things. Well. <laughs> so people can yes. go online and check out the schedule of events. But really, what is the goal of this week? I mean, Steve mentioned that it is so much more than, than that march that obviously draws thousands and thousands of people. But what is the point of all of these events and bringing them to our community? Well, there's something exceptional happening in San Antonio and something we just can't put our finger on. And we just have to just embrace it. We have the largest MLK march uh, in the nation. In, in, in our backyard is going to take place on the 16th. And now we have this summit that it's really community created. We have 150 hosts again uh, taking part in uh, creating this incredible, incredible uh, summit that, that touches on so many different subjects. Uh, the goal really will be for maybe 10, 20 years from, from now, maybe way past my lifetime that San Antonio becomes a destination for people to attempt to resolve conflict and celebrate also where how far we've come uh, as, uh, as a nation. It's also to give people a voice, right? Maybe people that, that don't, don't normally have a voice to, for their voices to be heard. Am I correct in that? Correct. Um, so we do, we believe that we have a community genius here and, uh, and we believe that it exists in every individual. Um, so we, we have to be careful that we do not, um, we just do not, we create channels where each superstar, someone who can bring more peace, more good into our community is celebrated and, and uh, you know, and we, and embraced really. So we have to be very, we, that's one of the things that we do for Dream Week is try and reach out to as many people as possible and try and find out the stars in everyone's uh, everyone's uh, neighborhood that, you know, the, the community hadn't, hadn't basically heard of before. Show, how excited are you about the fact that this is going to be the first real one returning from COVID, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. the first real dream week with no COVID restrictions around it. Yeah, it was very challenging during um, um, COVID, of course. Uh, we're so happy that the city and all the hosts have come have come back in full force. Uh, it's not easy to actually, you know, get as many uh, events in one uh, in one summit. And normally, most summits are curated by one or two uh, organizations. This is, like I say, it's community curated. We have all these organizations putting out and hosting events. It just tells you a lot about how um, who we are as a city. And, uh, and we don't put a cap on it. Eventually, I think we'll be seeing thousands of events in San Antonio and we're so excited for, uh, you know, this is our 11th year. We couldn't celebrate our 10th year anniversary uh, enough last year, but we hope that, you know, the next 10 years we'll see a tremendous growth. Uh, there's so much going on in the city that we need to celebrate. Yeah, uh, we, we were just showing- And share us also. We were just showing some video from 2020 and you just think about back to that time, yeah. all those people together, what happened in the years since. So this will mean so much this year that you are all are yes. back to normal. So tell people how they can find out about these events. Where's a, a, a website they can go to or details on whether you have to register. What do they need to know to be a part of Dream Week? So the majority of the Dream Week events are free and open to the public. Actually, they're all open to the public. It's just, um, I would say 95% of them are just free as well. Um, you can go to dreamweek.org slash events, and there'll be a calendar of events there, and it gives you a lot more detail about each event. Um, you can look around your local coffee shop or uh, downtown uh, um, restaurants and, and pick up a brochure, uh, a printed brochure. And um, you can also obviously uh, call us here at 210-444-2315 if you really want to get uh, involved as well. And we're also looking for candidates for 2024. We want to grow this now that we're back in full swing. Uh, we're open for business again. I love very thankful to the city. I love all of this. And it officially kicks off, Dream Week officially kicks off next Friday, is that correct? 
on Friday the 13th, our keynote speaker, uh, you know, County Judge Peter Sakai, who we're going to celebrate as the first um, um, uh, judge from uh, Asian American uh, origins. A lot of milestones as Dream Week comes back in full force in 2023. Show, thank you so much for being here. We sure appreciate your time and best of luck with all of the festivities. Thank you so much for having me and uh, look forward to seeing both of you at one or, one or two events, uh, hopefully. Oh yeah, we'll be there. You got it. Take care. <laughs> we'll be right back. Thank you.